All right, so Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice has been out in theaters for a little over a weekend now. Hopefully you've had the chance to go see the movie. Let's talk some spoilers. So, of course, that is a spoiler warning. If you haven't seen this movie and you're planning on it, don't watch this video because I will be talking about what happens in this movie in detail. If you have seen it or you don't care, then you can sit back and rest in peace. All right, let's go. So I'm gonna get this out of the way, the explanation this movie gives as to why Adam and Barbara Maitland are not in it. Just story-wise, I guess it does make sense. Lydia says at one point they found a loophole and moved on. I'm guessing that means they found a loophole in the handbook for the recently deceased. They do seem the types that would give that book a few more once-overs, so I guess they were able to move beyond, which I'll get to that later. So the story begins after that sweet new main title theme, which is awesome by the way. We learn that Lydia Dietz, she hosts this late night talk show, kind of like Elvira or something. It's called Ghost House, and so she's kind of like Ghost Hunters, I guess, with Rory, Justin Thoreau, who's her manager slash boyfriend. And yeah, I hate this character because he's like, he's so pathetic. You see right through him right away, which I'm sure that's the point. You're supposed to see through his charade right away so you can be like oh yeah he's only in it for the money but that's just it's so cliche isn't it in fact in terms of the overall narrative it really did seem unnecessary this movie has a lot of setup because it has a lot of story arcs to go through like we learn how charles deeds jeffrey jones character from the first movie we learn how he died and we learn from this like claymation segment which of course i understand why they did it that way because there's no way in hell jeffrey jones was going to come back for this movie just saying so we learned that he was on a plane that went down and he got eaten by a shark which yeah is a bit cartoonish even for beetlejuice at least in my opinion in the first movie nothing in the living world was really that outlandish. It was all the afterlife stuff that was weird. That makes sense. There's a contrast there, kind of like in Corpse Bride, same thing. In this movie, there's some pretty crazy stuff in the land of the living as well, and it just, it's different from the first movie. And not really in a good way, at least not to me. Still in the setup, we get Dolores coming in, which I love her introductory scene. When she's putting herself together, I was like, Sally! from The Nightmare Before Christmas. It was almost like exactly like her. Yeah, I was like, this is the live action mixture of Sally and Emily from Corpse Bride, played by Monica Bellucci, so that ain't no bad thing. In fact, given what she had in the movie, I thought she was really good. I would call her thing like the main overall conflict in this movie. But that being said, there is a large chunk of the movie that goes by later on where she's just nowhere to be seen because there is so much other shit going on. Yeah, it's a bit messy. But hey, Dolores comes back, she sucks out Danny DeVito's soul, and that's that. And we learned the backstory of Beetlejuice and Dolores. This is one of the scenes I thought was just way too over the top is where Beetlejuice is explaining this and it's all in like Italian, black and white. And I get that this is throwing back to like what Beetlejuice was while he was alive, but I personally didn't really want to know what he was before he died. I like the mystery of just him being a demon, but I didn't really care to know. So the fact that this movie tells that story while also introducing Dolores and her motive, I don't know, I just, I didn't really dig that decision. And also it was just really weird to make it black and white in Italian. I just, I don't get that. Yeah, I just wasn't a fan of that scene. Back in the land of the living, they're all mourning Charles Dietz, and Rory goes ahead and decides to propose to Lydia, which I was like, oh my god. Yeah, I just, I don't like this guy. And apparently neither does Astrid, Jenna Ortega. She goes off on her bike and eventually meets this kid named Jeremy, who, all right. The second scene he was in where she's in his room and you see the handbook for the recently deceased right there, I immediately was like, okay, so he's a ghost. That's what it's telling me. And I've talked with a couple of people who, they, they couldn't figure it out from there. I knew it right away, and I guess it's because I watched too many movies or something. I just, yeah, I knew right away. So yeah, Astrid can see ghosts after all, which means she owes her mother an apology for being standoffish and shit, which she does later on, and that's good. But yeah, the deal with this Jeremy kid is that he's just a murdering psycho. He killed his own parents, and then with a standoff with police, he fell from his treehouse and broke his neck and died instantly. So now he's been dead for 23 years, and he wants his psychotic life back. So he tricks Astrid into trading her life for his, which honestly was pretty cunning and clever of him, not gonna lie, that was a straight-up Slytherin move right there. Lydia gets word of this, and she's like, Ah, oh, crap. So she resorts to the only source she knows that could bring her to the other side to find her daughter. Yep, Lydia is the one who ends up summoning Beetlejuice. And bear in mind, this is well over halfway through the movie. Yeah, one could see everything that came before this as, like, all set up. To me, anyway, that's just another example of how sloppily put together this movie was. Again, I hate to say it. Although, let's be honest, Tim Burton hasn't really made a great movie in a while. So honestly, it's not that surprising. I was just hoping this would be his comeback, you know? Oh, well. And in my spoiler-free review, I said that there was a storyline that went unresolved even after the movie was over. I was talking about all the shrunken head dudes. When Lydia and Beetlejuice get to the afterlife, they bust a hole through the wall, and Beetlejuice is like, alright, Bob, don't let anyone else get away. And then all the other shrunken head dudes just go through the hole in the wall, and they end up in the living world, and they're all just set loose. No one ever goes after them. That's just a thing that's there now that's never solved. Yeah, that really bothered me. I get that this is a comedy first and foremost, and not everything has to be taken so seriously, but I just feel like compared to the first movie, it was more confined. It was more put 
put together than this one. And also with Jeremy. Because the way this movie sets him up, it looks like he's going to be such a big part of the plot, and he's really not. That whole story arc is over so fast. Because Lydia and Astrid and the father, they get there, and Jeremy's like, oh, you're too late. And then the guy at Will Call at Immigration or whatever, it turns out to be Beetlejuice, and he's like, I believe it was Dostoevsky who said, Later, fucker. Which I love that line, by the way. That was awesome. And then the door opens underneath Jeremy, and he just drops to hell, and that's that. Yeah, after that scene was done, I was like, wait, that's just over? Just like that? Okay, I guess we just don't have to worry about that anymore. I guess that's just done. Like, anticlimactic doesn't even begin to describe that. Yeah, it's just sloppy writing. Although, rewinding a little bit, that sandworm scene was awesome. I just love seeing the sandworms in this movie, and they're all stop motion, and they're just big, and they're great. And Delia dies. Which, yeah, of course, that does make sense. She gets these two asps for, like, this, what does she call it? Like, this artistic expression of sorrow that she wants to put together for Charles. Again, it's just Delia being her neurotic self. I love it. So, of course, she would cause her own death. That's just so in character for her. Yeah, that made a lot of sense because she was scammed. She thought that these asps were defanged, but they weren't. So they just bite her neck and then she drops over dead. And when she opened her eyes, she was dead as dust. Her jewels were missing and her heart was bust. So she made a vow lying under that tree. Nah, okay, I'm not gonna go on with that. I love that song, okay? I do love how this movie does expand on the lore of the neither world. It shows that this, like, neither world that we see is really just, it's limbo, it's purgatory. It's the waiting room and immigration and the train station that leads to what is the actual afterlife. We see, like, on the sign at the train station, it says, like, pearly gates, the great beyond, the fires of damnation. I was like, okay, so there is more to death than this in this universe. I actually really like that a lot. So props to the writers on that for expanding the lore here. So I imagine that's where Adam and Barbara moved on to. Either the Great Beyond or the Pearly Gates, I imagine. Wherever they are, I hope they're happy. And Charles Dietz is in this movie, or at least half of him is anyway. <laughs> yeah, like we see the bottom half of his body because the top half was eaten off by a shark. So we see like his torso-less body walking around, which is so gross, man. There's like that one blood vessel that keeps spurting up blood. I was like, ugh, that's really gross. Especially when he comes across Delia and she's like, Charles, and she's getting the blood on her face. I was like, oh my God, really Burton? Just, ugh. That was funny. Eventually, we get to the wedding, and this is this scenario, because Rory's expecting to marry Lydia, but then Beetlejuice and Delia show up, because Lydia agreed to marry Beetlejuice to rescue her daughter. She signed the contract and everything. But again, the way that this movie's climax is a wedding, that is, I will say, classic Tim Burton. That's very Corpse Bride. I love that, actually. It's a great call. And I do love how Beetlejuice exposes Rory with that truth serum, and Rory just spills out everything. Yeah, that was a great scene. And then they kick off with the whole MacArthur Park song, which at first I thought was hilarious, because everyone's mouthing along, but it looks like they don't want to. I I love that. That's so funny in terms of facial acting, especially from Bern Gorman. Oh my god, I was on the floor. He's all like singing along like this, like, what am I doing? I cracked up. You might say I died laughing. Yeah! But then the song kept going and going, and you realize they're doing the whole song. Yeah, in my opinion, that scene went on for a bit too long. You compare it to the Deo scene from the first movie, that scene was just about like half the song, just as long as it needed to be to be funny. This one started out strong, but ended up just driving it into the ground. Again, at least in my opinion. But it's okay because then Dolores comes in, and you're like, oh yeah, she's in this movie because she's been gone for a while. Just another story arc that comes into this movie that's already convoluted with a lot of story arcs. Although, I'll admit, what happens next is awesome. Because Astrid opens up a door to the Saturn moon, and a sandworm comes bursting through, which I love Beetlejuice knows what to do this time around. He does the whole matador thing. He's like, ole! I love that. And seeing the sandworm just burst around the church, that was so cool. I swear, this movie made me flip-flop so many times as to liking and being disappointed by it. My eyes started doing the dizzy swirly thing. And so the sandworm gets rid of Dolores and Rory, apparently. Rory dies. I mean, granted, I will say he had it coming, but it was still pretty sudden. Yeah, the sandworm gets them pretty much the same way it got Beetlejuice in the first movie, by just crashing them through the floor. And so that's that. So that's wrapped up, but there's still a contract between Lydia and Beetlejuice, which Astrid uses logic to get rid of, which I actually thought was all right, because she's pretty much like, oh, you broke rules too, so that makes your contract null and void, and it burns up, and I was like, okay, that's fair, I'll give you that. And then Lydia says his name three times, which makes him inflate and blow up and pop like a balloon, and he's like, I should have got married in Vegas. And I was like, all right, so he's gone. Is he gone forever? I don't know. I actually really don't get it. Is he gonna end up back in the waiting room like in the first movie? I assume that we're probably just never gonna know because a third movie is probably never gonna happen. Unfortunate, yes, but it is what it is, at least for now. But then there's this whole epilogue. It's like Astrid finds this guy at Dracula's castle and they get married and they have a kid. And it's like Astrid gives birth to this Beetlejuice baby that reminds me of Chucky because it does. And this whole time I was like, what the f- fuck am I watching? It does turn out to just be a dream that Lydia's having, to which I was like, 
Okay, but still that was weird and you see Beetlejuice wake up next to her and he's like I just had the weirdest dream and then she wakes up again and he's gone I was like, okay So is Beetlejuice actually back and now is he's just haunting her dreams? Is she traumatized? Is she going through PTSD or some shit again? You don't really know this movie does kind of leave it open to interpretation like that Which I actually do like but yeah that ending epilogue was just super fucking weird dude like too much for my taste personally So in conclusion Beetlejuice Beetlejuice like I said It just made me dizzy going back and forth so fast between liking it and being disappointed that it did leave me neutral. There are equally as many things I liked as things I didn't. That is my final stance on the movie. The stuff I liked, I really, really did like. I loved it. But the stuff that let me down, it really, really let me down. So yeah, spoiler alert, Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is not gonna be in my top 10 movies of 2024 list. If you like this movie more than me, that is cool. Power to you, dude. I wish I could be in that same boat. I really do. But hey, what is the world without differing opinions, huh? So Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, now that it's been out for a while, I will ask you, what was your favorite thing about the movie and what was your least favorite thing whatever you think go ahead and leave a comment and of course thank you for subscribing peace